questions. Thank you so much. Um, so I, like Beverly said, um, I'm Sundara Kohli, um, and I'm really excited to be talking about clinical obesity pharmacotherapy, just because I think it's a great tool for clinicians in any field. Um, Dr. Lofton, did you want to say anything before we start, or do you want to start? Yeah, it's just with the trials group, I think of us being the leaders in teaching our non-obesity medicine colleagues about the importance of diagnosing, preventing, and treating obesity and overweight as medical conditions. So really thank you for your attention and time tonight. I know we don't have a lot of time, so we'll get onto it, but please feel free to use this as a guide for teaching your resident students, fellows, other colleagues, family, because I think it's a great topic. Yes. True, very true. Um, and then I have no financial disclosures. And you yeah. see my disclosures there. Yep. And then our clinical objectives. So we have a few things. Um, we're gonna be focusing on the evaluation of patients for different types of pharmacotherapy in order to customize and personalize the medications, understanding the pathophysiology um, that really allows you to uh, speak more to your health savvy patients and also explain the reason why. We will be talking about the FDA approved medications. There are um, off label medications, but that won't be discussed in this presentation. Um, we'll be talking about what's happening um, in the pipeline that um, would be coming up in the upcoming year, and then resources for you outside of this presentation. Um, let me know if at any point you're not hearing me well enough. As to why we're talking about this, uh, this is just the epidemiology of obesity. You can see the prevalence of obesity in adults um, above the age of 18. That means um, having a BMI greater or equal to 30. And this is um, in the, by 2016, um, which was you know already five years ago. And you can see um, quite a number of people who, and quite a number of uh, countries that have at least 35 to 40% or even above really 25% of their population that are categorized as patients with obesity or people with obesity. Go so I'll talk some about the pathophysiology of obesity. We know this is a complex disease that is more than just our calories in, calories out. And again, I encourage you to inform your patients about the complexities of obesity and the hormonal regulation of appetite. So here we can see the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, which is uh, partially what regulates our appetite. And we have our POMC cart, our anorexigenic or our decreased food intake uh, neuro transmitters, postsynaptic membrane, and then we have our neuropeptide Y and agouti related protein uh, membrane, which is erexogenic or increases uh, food intake and, and hunger. So these are the pathways by which we use medications to target the hormonal regulation of appetite, which tends to make us want to eat more. So you can see here that leptin acts positively, leptin from the adipose tissue acts positively on the POMC cart pathway um, to activate a decrease in appetite. And we're starting to see some leptin analogs you know, on the market for our pipeline medications. And I'm sure you're familiar with the GLP-1s. We'll talk a little bit more about this later today. These downregulate the orexigenic pathways, all which then feed into our MC4 receptor pathway. This is the Milano cortican uh, pathway that can control whether we're increasing or decreasing our appetite and our feeding behavior. And one thing we won't talk about today because these are specifically regulated for um, people who are diagnosed and confirmed to have genetic syndromes of obesity because they can have mutations in the MC4 receptor pathway, which can lead to insatiable hunger defined as hyperphagia and very early age onset obesity. So I just do want to mention that because we have our drug set melanotide, which is a recently approved, also still in clinical trials for those patients who have genetic obesity. But I know those are discussed in some of the other trials, uh, roots, uh, lectures. So I just mentioned we won't talk about those today, but there was recently set melanotide that was approved for patients with those rare genetic um, mutations. So these are areas of those are in science can really target some of our appetite regulation to uh, limit food intake, decrease hunger, 
And some of the other medications we'll talk about later do actually uh, have the opportunity to increase energy expenditure, which none of our currently utilized medications uh, do specifically. So when you first, um, when you first see a, a patient with obesity, um, notice that I am using um, a specific way to address patients, um, which is what they prefer, which is um, uh, first for people first, um, in which um, you want to identify um, their medical history, which is really important in terms of obesity related and non obesity related comorbidities. So whether that's hypertension, diabetes, um, OSA, um, those are all uh, important to address and um, important for the patient to understand that these are a indirect and direct cause of obesity. Um, you want to identify previous surgeries that the patient had, um, included, including previous bariatric surgeries, because um, as we know, um, many times patients regain weight or tend to slowly uh, gain weight, and that's when you want to um, intercept and help them out. Uh, whether they had a um, cholecystectomy or had their gallbladder removed, oftentimes um, uh, rapid or extreme weight loss can result in gallstones. So you want to uh, prevent that if they do have their gallbladder still. Um, and whether they've had any sort of knee or hip replacement um, in the past, those are weight bearing uh, joints, which again, um, are an incentive to either uh, prevent that from happening or letting patients understand that this, uh, you want to preserve your new joint as well. Um, those are just a few of the key points that you want to make sure that you note down. Um, in terms of weight history, which is new for a lot of clinicians, is you do want to um, understand when the onset of their obesity started, the rate of their weight gain, um, current or history um, of eating disorders, which you want to make sure that you're not promoting with the type of medications that are available, um, as well as methods used in previous weight loss attempts, um, and then their nutrition. Um, an easy way to understand their nutrition is do a simple 24-hour food recall. So what did they eat in the last 24 hours? Um, and their activity level, um, mild, moderate, or um, extreme activities, um, and medications that can cause weight gain, which we'll go into um, in the next couple slides. Then you also want to focus on their social history. So their socioeconomic status. Um, a, a lot of times uh, this was a lot very prevalent during the pandemic um, to really understand what was available to patients, what they can afford. Um, sometimes patients don't have um, refrigerators or they live in um, transient uh, living conditions. So those are important to identify um, as barriers and or as contributors to their current weight. Uh, stressors and life events, uh, social habits, um, obviously, such as drinking, but also um, do they uh, partake in um, other drug use that might cause um, hunger? Do they uh, associate with people that also contribute to um, their eating habits? Um, their sleep. Um, a lot of um, studies show that sleeping less than a certain number of hours, usually less than seven hours, will um, increase your cortisol, will increase your hunger. So identifying sleep as well as are they um, night shift workers, um, identifying uh, disturbances in circadian rhythm. Um, place of residence from clinic. Um, that lets you know how often these patients can uh, do follow-up visits, how um, consistent they'll be, and their telehealth capabilities as well. That also allows you to know how easy follow-up might be for these patients. Um, as I spoke about earlier, medication history. So these are um, different classes of medication, and a lot of them, many physicians might not associate with weight gain, but they definitely are. And here in this column, we have alternatives associated with less weight gain or weight neutral or inducing weight loss alternatives. So um, a lot of things, a lot of medications that might, um, you know, that are more obvious are steroids, for example, um, or a lot of antidepressants. However, the ones that are more surprising to most physicians or even um, patients would be um, uh, insulin uh, is an example. Uh, we have beta blockers as an example, and you can see um, alternatives to that. 
as well as oral contraceptive pills, just depending on what type uh, they are, usually older generation ones. And then antihistamines, uh, your over-the-counter diphenhydramine. Um, so these are all uh, types of medications that you wanna identify and see if alternatives are feasible or introducing the idea to speak to their physician who is prescribing them. Um, another thing you want to do is establish a baseline. So obviously you're going to be doing a physical exam and you want to look at um, underlying genetic causes of obesity um, in terms of whether they have a lipedema, uh, which is uh, you want to look at the patterns of fat distribution. So when you look at this picture here, um, this is a disorder known as lipedema, which cannot be generally fixed with our um, normal methods of weight loss or diet changes. Unfortunately, this is a very stubborn type of uh, weight distribution, of excess weight distribution that has to be addressed more with liposuction or surgical methods. Um, you also want to look at um, obesity related um, comorbidity signs such as um, uh, linea nigra, uh, which is discoloration that occurs usually on the back of your neck. Oh, sorry, not linea nigra. Um, it's actually um, acanthosis nigricans. Um, linea nigra is in pregnancy, but acanthosis nigricans is a uh, darkish, darkish velvet discoloration that occurs on the back of your neck or um, in your axillary uh, underarms. Um, those are other signs you want to look at. Um, patterns of fat distribution, which we show, uh, which we talked about with lipedema, but also with menopause, uh, the fat distribution occurs more around the waist, which can um, increase your uh, visceral risk factor as well. And uh, mechanical consequences of obesity. We spoke about knee and hip replacement, so you want to pay close um, attention to. Um, how much weight is being pushed onto those weight bearing joints in order to prevent these patients from undergoing replacements down the line. Sorry, let me see if I can go back. Um, you wanna get your blood work, which is just really your normal CBC comprehensive metabolic panel, which includes your hepatic panel, um, looking at your creatinine and kidney function, your A1C, which allows us the, to let us know the last three months of your glucose control, your lipid pan panel, which includes both your good and bad cholesterol, and your TSH to make sure that hypothyroidism is not contributing to, um, to uh, the uh, weight gain. Um, and then you want to do body composition. So thus, uh, you want to measure as a baseline so that way you can measure um, each time they come in or every few visits, um, their waist circumference, their hip circumference. Um, obviously you're gonna be looking at their BMI, both for them, um, also for insurance purposes. Um, and then you wanna get a baseline heart rate and blood pressure because many of the medications, not many, but a few of the medications um, can affect both of them. So you wanna make sure they are always within the normal parameters. So when we talk about pharmacotherapy, first you have to evaluate whether they qualify for them. So those are individuals with a BMI of more than 30 or more than 27 with comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, OSA, just to name a few. Um, then um, if it's patients who have not achieved their target weight loss following bariatric surgery or endoscopy, or if they've regained weight after those surgical or endos endoscopic therapies. So here we have six um, FDA approved medications. We have fentramine, um, Qsimia, which is fentramine and topiramate, um, Orlistat, um, Contrave, which is naltrexone and bupropion, liraglutide, three, uh, three milligrams is the FDA approved one, and then semaglutide, 2.4 milligrams is the dosage that is FDA approved as well. So Dr. Lofton's going to go Yeah, so we'll move on to some clinical cases just to change the pace a little bit. Uh, this is actually a patient and we have in clinic. Uh, MS is a 30-year-old female who presents for weight management after minimal weight loss with diet and exercise. I'm sure you're familiar with the patient like this. She has a knee arthritis. Her meds are um, pretty run-the-mill with Tylenol and her oral contraceptive. Family history is consistent 
um, with her mother's hypothyroidism and her father has lung cancer. Social history, she does not use alcohol, drugs, she does not smoke. She lives alone, works as a teacher, and she does note that she recently had a lapse in her insurance, so she does not have medication coverage. I'll tell you why this is important um, when we come to the, the, the decision on what to do for her medication. And then with her abuse system, she reports positive weight increase, hunger, and knee pain, and she reports no chest pain or palpitations. On physical exam, she has normal vital signs. Her weight is 205 pounds. She has a normal uh, heart and pulmonary exam, and you do an EKG, you find that she has normal sinus rhythm with a normal QTC interval. So when I'm thinking about the best medication for a patient, uh, I have sort of have a mnemonic that's looking at first the safety. So we want to see what the patient's uh, indications and contraindications are. So certain patients uh, may not be able to take certain medications, so you can just cross those off the list, either, either family history, uh, a vital sign that's abnormal, or another medication, for example. Then I think about the efficacy. Given the patient characteristics, what will be the best medication to help this patient with not only their weight, but possibly other medical conditions that they have or may be at great risk for? And then I do think about the cost. So we have the safety, efficacy, and cost, SEC. And uh, it's important to know this patient needs something that's within the range that she can pay for reasonably, something that's not going to be uh, a rent payment for her, for example. So on this particular patient, uh, we can see on the next few slides, we decided to start with the medication in conjunction with lifestyle therapy to use fentramine. So fentramine is a norepinephrine releasing agent. The effect of it is that it suppresses appetite. Um, it also um, will, the total overall effect is that you will lose about six 0.06% um, with about 15 milligram dose daily versus a 1.71% with placebo. So this is not how much you lose daily, obviously, but this is over time. Adverse effects are dizziness, dry mouth, insomnia, irritability, hypertension, and tachycardia, which is why we check those vitals initially and as well as every visit. Contraindications are cardiovascular disease, hyperthyroidism, angle closure, glaucoma, and then the concurrent use of um, MAO inhibitors uh, used for um, depression or um, psychosis, um, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. Dosing, um, there's different types of pills that are available in different doses. So there's eight milligrams, 15 milligrams, 30, or um, 37.5 milligrams. Um, the smallest dose, you it has a shorter half-life, so you can dose it uh, three times a day. That's known as Lomira. Uh, 15 milligrams once a day, um, and the 30 milligrams as well, or the 37.5, you can dose it once a day or half a pill twice a day. Um, the ones that are 15, 30, and 37.5, uh, when you take it uh, as a whole, you want to make sure that you take it in the morning um, because it can um, cause stimulation and insomnia. So you generally want to take it about one to two hours before breakfast. So clinically, this patient was quite happy with using fentramine after three months. You saw her monthly, she lost a total of 15 pounds and her vital signs remain stable. She reports no major adverse effects. Uh, while she's pleased with the results after taking fentramine, she does complain that she has dry mouth and some anxiety uh, at the dose, and she now has insurance. I should add that in there. So she wants to know if there are other options which might be available to minimize her side effects. So this particular patient, uh, who was on 30 milligrams of fentramine doing well and having side effects um, with the ability to get something covered by insurance. At this time, we decided to go with um, the combination of fentramine and topiramate. 
which brings us to our next uh, medication that's available. So fentramine and topiramate together is known as Qsimia. So it does, if you look at the mechanism of action, you have the norepinephrine releasing um, agent, which is the fentramine, and topiramate blocks voltage-gated sodium and calcium channels and inhibits carbonic anhydrase. Overall, the effect is appetite suppression through two different mechanisms. So you can see that the total body weight loss is 9.8% um, in this uh, com combination medication. If you remember with fentramine alone, it was about 6%. And compared to placebo, um, you know, they lost about 1.2%. So it is quite a big uh, difference both versus placebo and uh, fentramine alone. Adverse effects include the same adverse effects that we saw with fentramine. However, we have the uh, added ones of paresthesias, which is numbness in your fingers and toes. Um, you'll have uh, dizziness, dysquasia, which is um, an abnormal um, taste in your mouth. Um, and then you have insomnia, constipation, and dry mouth, which come from the fentramine part of the uh, tablet. Contraindications, uh, hyperthyroidism, angle closure glaucoma, again, um, same if you are using a MAO inhibitor or if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, again, that's actually important to add that you do also want to make sure you take um, a pregnancy test uh, when you first see the patient too, or uh, ensure that they are on a proper, using proper birth control and want to note that. The dosing that's available for these tablets are 3.75 milligrams um, slash 23 milligrams uh, that you take daily for 14 days, and then you increase them to the 7.5 milligram or 46 milligram daily dose. What's important is that you do need to um, decide whether they're actually effectively losing weight. So when do you discontinue Qsimia? Um, so if 3% weight, weight loss is not achieved after 12 weeks of being on the higher dose, 7.5 or 46 mil, uh, slash 46 milligram dose, or um, if 5% weight loss has not been achieved after 12 weeks on a maximum dose. So you do, you can um, escalate them on higher doses, which can be the 15 um, slash 92 milligram dose. Um, and then if you want to stop them on this completely, what you wanna do is discontinue the 15 milligram, 92 milligram uh, dose gradually by taking a dose every other day for at least one week prior to stopping the treatment altogether, just because stopping topiramate, um, that aspect of it can precipitate a seizure if stopped suddenly. So you do wanna make sure you taper. Orlistat is more familiar with many people. Um, it's also known as Ally. Um, found, you can um, see it in a lot of drug stores. So um, mechanism of action is it's a lipase inhibitor. Um, what it does is that it basically causes triglycerides um, that come in through food uh, become unabsorbed. So that will, uh, in the end, cause a caloric deficit. Your total body weight loss is 8.8% at one year. And this is on the 120 milligram uh, three times a day dosing versus 5.8% with placebo. Adverse effects because you're not, your body is not absorbing these fats are satoria. So that fat will go out through uh, your stool. Um, also result in oily spotting in the toilet, fatty stool, which causes stool to float. Um, fecal incontinence, again, it's just going through your body very fast because it's not being absorbed. The way that you take this medication is actually before meals. So that way it can um, be the most effective. Contraindications, obviously, if you have a chronic malabsorption syndrome that can be exacerbated by taking this medication, cholestasis, which is just your um, the uh, stasis or um, where your bile acids and bile fats will stay in your gallbladder, and that can lead to gallstones um, at a higher frequency. And then again, pregnancy or breastfeeding, which are kind of a... Um, umbrella contraindication for any of these weight loss medications. So we have a second case. This is DA and he is a 54 year old lawyer who presents 
with complaints of a 20 pound weight gain over the last year. He states that since his office began sharing space with a catering company, he sits right next to the baked goods and all the leftover cakes they have and he finds it hard to resist them. This weight gain has affected his mood and he's worried that he may develop medical problems with these eating patterns. Your partner in your practice saw him for the last two months and gave him fentramine. And while he did notice his appetite was suppressed, he found it hard to avoid these sweets that were constantly presented to him and he's not lost weight. This patient has no medical problems, takes no medications and his physical exam is normal. So using the same acronym, first thinking about safety, this patient has a pretty bland medical history, so there are lots of options. However, fentramine was ineffective, so I would take that one off the list. Uh, we might think that Qsimia may not be the best option if he was on fentramine for a while, though that could really be considered, but those might be lower on the list of medications thinking about efficacy, being that he has tried those uh, medications containing fentramine already. Now, as far as what we're really trying to treat here, this is a patient who is prone to having cravings or desires to eat. Uh, he's maybe having some surges in his dopamine and serotonin when he has the sweets. We're really looking for something that can replicate that without giving him untoward side effects. So in this case, we decided to prescribe this patient the medication naltrexone through propion sustained release. So this um, medication, the mechanism of action here is that it is able, it increases your norepinephrine and dopamine. So by inhibiting its um, reuptake, and it's also an opioid receptor antagonist, which is what naltrexone is uh, when used alone. <coughs> Excuse me. The effect of this overall is that you have appetite suppression. Your total body weight loss here is 5% at 56 weeks versus 1.3% with placebo. <clears throat> Sorry, one second. I can go for the rest of the slide, take your time. Okay. Uh, with this medication, we warn patients of potential side effects of nausea, potentially vomiting, uh, GI related side effects are possible, diarrhea, constipation, and then the constitutional side effects of headache and dizziness and uh, some insomnia, usually due to the propion aspect. So this is contraindicated if patients have uh, extreme uh, suicidality in indicated uh, ideation or history of suicidal behavior because of the potential for propion to um, facilitate a drive in the patient who has suicidal ideation to actually act on those ideations. Again, uh, concurrent use of MAOIs or opioids. So the naltrexone component is an opioid antagonist. And if a patient is on this medication, we combine it with something, let's say, is an oxycodone, the patient will not be able to get the pain numbing effect of that opioid. And that could lead the patient to take more and more opioids. And we know that would be a very negative outcome. So I do warn patients when prescribing this for the first time, in the event that you have a tooth extraction, the doctor gives you a Vicodin, for example, we would have to discontinue this temporarily. And also if you were to have a surgical procedure, we would discontinue this prior so that you can get the benefits of your pain numbing medication. Other contraindications would be history of seizure disorder as a bupropion withdrawal could precipitate seizures uh, and anorexia or bulimia and of course pregnancy and breastfeeding. And again, we always want to look to determine if the patient is a responder. So we look for 5% weight loss, which is considered clinically meaningful at 12 weeks to determine if the patient uh, is the candidate. To advance the slide. Uh, one thing we didn't mention there is the dosing of this. So this titrates up over about four weeks. So I think it's week one, one pill, week two, two pills, week three, three pills, and week four is four pills. So in this case, DA was taking this medication as prescribed and was able to titrate up to four pills a day. He's no longer making these trips that are driving him to take in sweets uh, for snacks. He's lost weight and his mood has improved. So I think this is a positive outcome. Um, in, in our clinic, this patient actually did really well. He went on to lose about 60 pounds using this medication. And he actually did titrate down a little bit uh, after he reached the four pills a day and 
ultimately he still works in the same office with the same catering company and he's retrained himself to avoid the desire for these uh, sweets and he's done very well. That's great. And then that brings us to our next category, which are GLP-1 receptor agonists, which many people see commercials for and probably are more familiar with. So the FDA approved versions are liraglutide at three milligrams and semaglutide 2.4 milligrams. So the mechanism of action for these are GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, overall, their effect is appetite suppression through um, uh, whether it's uh, uh, increased gas, uh, decreased gastric emptying, so the food stays longer in your stomach, causing you to feel fullness longer. Um, there's also peripheral uh, utilization of increasing your insulin sensitivity, um, as well as working directly through um, the hypothalamus through the GLP-1 receptor agonists and then the um, uh, anorexigenic pathway. So the total body weight loss with liraglutide at three milligrams is 8% at 56 weeks with the three milligram dosage daily versus 2.6% with placebo. Then you have um, semaglutide 2.4 milligrams saw a weight loss of 14.9% at 68 weeks versus 2.4% with placebo. Adverse effects, um, we grouped um, all of these because the adverse effects and um, indications, everything is similar. So they include hypoglycemia, constipation, acute pancreatitis, and cholithiasis. Um, absolute um, contraindications are personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer or any of the cancers associated with the MEN2 category, and then obviously pregnancy or breastfeeding. The dosing for liraglutide is you start at 0.6 milligrams. You're going to inject that subcutaneously in your stomach, thigh, or arm once a day for the first week. You're going to go up to 1.2 two milligrams once a day for that second week, and then you're going to max out at 1.8 milligrams once a day. Semaglutide is a different dosing where you start at 0.25 milligrams. That is a once weekly dosage for that first month. Then you're going to escalate to 0.5 milligrams, again, once a week dosing for that second month. Um, and then one milligrams, uh, one milligram dosage once a week, um, for that following month, go up to 1.7 and then 2.4 milligrams, which is where you're going to stay. Um, you're going to discontinue if you don't achieve more than 4% weight loss at 16 weeks with liraglutide. May I just interject here, Sandura, uh, with the liraglutide, the weight management dose does increase uh, after 1.8 to 2.4 subcutaneous for a week and okay. then the gold dose of three milligrams. Of oh, three, after. yes. Just actually, left yes. those two out. Sorry. Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, you're right. <laughs> um, and then, Dr. Lofton, if you wanted to talk about this slide. Yes, yeah, so we have a case here. So uh, in our clinic, we have patients who present for medical management after having gastric bypass or other surgeries. So while any of these uh, patients who present in this manner, you can use the acronym I mentioned before to determine what's safe for them, what's efficacious, and what the cost um, will be most efficient for the patient and their insurance. But and I do find commonly that using the GLP-1 agonist um, is more beneficial for patients who've had weight regain after bariatric surgery. So there have been studies published looking at GLP-1 related uh, pharmacotherapies and non-GLP-1 pharmacotherapies, and they did show that the GLP-1 pharmacotherapies were superior in treating weight regain after bariatric surgery. So I received, recently presented some data at Obesity Week looking specifically at weight regain after gastric bypass, and we looked at um, almost 100 patients who had lost weight but regained after gastric bypass, and this is uh, one of those patients. So you can see how a gastric bypass did quite well with the weight loss, but over a five-year period had some weight regain. We know that these changes, while they can be attributed to lifestyle changes in environment, um, do have a lot to do with the hormonal regulation of appetite and fat metabolism. So when patients lose weight, their metabolic rate goes down, their basal metabolic rate decreases, and often we try to encourage patients to increase it by exercising, which ups their total energy expenditure. We know it's been very difficult to sustain long-term. 
That paired with an increase in our hunger hormone, ghrelin, and a decrease in our, our appetite suppressing hormone and our satiety inducing hormone can lead to weight regain. So this environment and physiologic change can cause this weight regain. So on this patient you see here, next slide please, uh, we decided to utilize loraglutide and the patient was able to achieve meaningful weight loss, which was uh, greater than five to 10% weight loss. But also you can see they reached a weight that was lower than their post-operative nadir. So this was just some of the findings that we see in clinic and also in the study, um, particularly with patients after bariatric surgery. So we talk a lot about tailoring pharmacotherapy. So when they have the comorbidities such as diabetes, GLP-1 receptor agonists um, that are FDA approved would be uh, beneficial because they also have the added benefit of decreasing A1C. Um, if they have a concurrent diagnosis of depression, then naltrexone and bupropion would make the most sense because they also would affect mood in a positive way. And then migraines, um, fentramine, topiramate, or otherwise known as Qsimias, as topiramate also individually is used to treat migraines. And then night eating syndrome, um, which is um, a very specific diagnosis, um, topiramate has been shown to be effective in decreasing night eating syndrome. Um, and then you can see uh, listed down here, we see the benefits of uh, medications added to um, specific surgeries or devices. So intragastric balloons plus medications showed an excess BMI loss of um, 40 versus intragastric balloons alone caused an excess BMI loss of 20 at 12 months um, at the follow-up. And um, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, uh, which is um, in more recent years um, has been um, become more popular that plus medications has shown a 25% total body weight loss versus 20% with just ESG alone at 12 months uh, follow-up. And then bariatric surgery. Uh, so the sleeve plus medication has shown a 28% total body weight loss versus 22% of um, weight loss with LSG alone at six months follow-up. And these are from various studies um, that have been published. So I'll talk a little bit about the pipeline medications that are currently in trials. Uh, so the first we have terzepatide, which is a medication that has uh, been utilized in trials for both type two diabetes, as well as for obesity management. So this is an interesting mechanism. And I think it's something that we will see more of in the future because we know that the body is very resilient, does not like to lose weight. When we turn off one pathway, such as using a GLP-1 receptor agonist, the body turns turns on another pathway to make the patient's weight increase. So this dual uh, agonism of using a GIP as well as a, a called GLP receptor agonism uh, actually is one of the mechanisms that does not only affect appetite regulation, but energy expenditure. And its results are looking promising in the trials for obesity management. And then we look at our appetite regulating uh, agonists. So metroleptin, again, is an injection that is a leptin agonist. And we know how leptin works to activate the POMC cart, uh, decrease desire for food, food intake, uh, hunger behaviors. And then also, uh, I wish they'd come with an easier name to say than this, but kegrilantide, which is a long acting amylin analog. And we know that amylin uh, also is shown increasing benefits in helping patients uh, reduce food intake. And also this medicine has shown great results when combined with semaglutide. So really looking forward to uh, the results of some of these trials that are ongoing with these pipeline medications. And for those of you who are um, early prescribers or, or teaching fellows or students, these are going to be the medications that are going to be uh, very uh, new and utilized most often likely when those uh, students and residents are in practice. And then um, I know that we spoke a little bit about ESG, which is the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, which has become more popular in recent years. Um, there's different techniques used there, as well as intragastric balloons. Um, I think there was also a recent FDA approved uh, balloon 
adding to the um, already FDA ones. And then here we have testing, which um, a novel blood test that will accurately predict obesity phenotypes that will allow us to personalize into obesity treatments um, um, even further, which would be exciting. I'm not sure um, how the science behind this is, but um, I'm interested to see exactly how it will be in clinical practice. And then we have resources for continued learning. Um, so this uh, lecture is recorded and hopefully will be available for a little while. Then you can also find further lectures um, with our continued roots uh, curriculum at the tristateobesitysociety.org, um, as well as um, Obesity Medical Association, also known as OMA. Um, they have um, quite a few lectures as well, and they also have um, a lot of um, resources uh, such as books and um, uh, question, question banks as well. Um, there is also uh, the Handbook of Obesity, which is also a great um, textbook, uh, really, that I reference quite a bit. The Blackburn Course of Obesity Medicine is an annual course um, offered every year. Um, I believe they were offering it virtually the last uh, couple years, but um, I'm not sure how it's going to be going forward. Um, uh, the advanced, uh, if you're interested in the endoscopic um, methods, there's only one fellowship um, that teaches the bariatric endosco endoscopic methods, um, even though you can go and observe and really uh, incorporate that into your practice. Uh, but there is one dedicated fellowship at Brigham and Young. Um, and then if you want to be certified in obesity and um, add that to your roster, um, you can learn more about how to be certified in it, both through the fellowship pathway, as well as a non-fellowship pathway through credits through um, the ABOM or American Board of Obesity Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we're I think we have a couple minutes to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, so I see a question in the chat from Emily. Thanks, so I'll respond to, to that first. And the question is, for patients with depression who already take antidepressants that are not Wellbutrin, do you feel comfortable additionally prescribing Contrave? So just to uh, reiterate, Contrave is bupropion with naltrexone. So, and it really depends one on the duration. And this is this is my personal clinical anecdote. You know, others may do things differently. Um, when, when patients are on antidepressants, and especially if I think the weight gain is related to those antidepressants, I will ask the patient, how long have you been on this and is it continuing to help you? Because if you've been on a weight gaining antidepressant for 10 years and you change doctors three times, they continue to prescribe it, it may be worth uh, consulting with a psychopharmacologist, maybe wean off that medication, which may benefit the weight and potentially take on something like a contrave. Um, if patients are on multiple serotonin inducing agents, I do not uh, like to start a dopamine agonist uh, medication because of the potential interaction. So uh, if patients are on one and they're stable, uh, I do try to get their other prescribers input before, before considering this and may consider a titration uh, schedule that's slower than what it is prescribed in the label. So that's my anecdotal experience, but it's you know up to others' clinical interpretation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we have another question from Erica. And the question is: with the risk of pancreatitis for GLP-1s, is there a certain level of triglycerides at which you do not use these agents? So yes, yeah, so if I remember correctly, the risk of uh, pancreatitis is about 0.3%. Uh, and I have seen pancreatitis in uh, patients in which I prescribe GLP-1s. And I'll tell you in those patients, I think the most important thing that we can do to make sure our patients stay safe is inform them about the potential risk of pancreatitis. Inform them this is a rare adverse effect, but if you even think you have these symptoms of vomiting with abdominal and back pain and fever, stop the medication and let me know. Because we can really save these patients from uh, adverse sequelae, such as hospitalization, surgery, and of course, a lot of discomfort. Um, so in the patients I have had experienced pancreatitis, uh, luckily, thankfully, they reported their symptoms, stopped the medication, we did not restart it. That being said, patients with uh, high triglycerides, this is, you know, 300 and up is kind of my level in which I would not consider this. 
as um, one of the first line medications because of the high risk of pancreatitis. Um, again, that's not set in stone in prescribing a uh, label either, but those patients I would consider, it, you know, it's lower on the, on the list because of that potential for uh, pancreatitis most. Do we have any other questions? Okay, here's a long one. Thank you, Eugene. Have you seen any of the GLP-1 receptor agonists being associated with severe fatigue in some patients? Uh, and then goes on to say, it's rare, but appears to be underreported. And we've seen it a few times. So just wondering if we've seen it as well. And we have insight into which patients are more likely to develop the side effect and do we have any strategies which have helped to mitigate the fatigue effect to enable continued GLP-1 usage. So yes, in patients who are prescribed GLP-1s, you may get these phone calls, I feel really tired. And the patients I tend to see this in are one smaller frame patients. So if we have a patient who's, you know, 5'2", five, 5'1", five, who meets BI, BMI criteria barely, I find that these patients are more likely to report the side effect. And my thoughts are, I have not confirmed this with lab tests, are these patients are experiencing a relative hypoglycemia that may not be documented. If you check an AccuCheck, it may not be 58, but if they're used to running, it may be 150. And these medications are so effective in lowering their glucose to say 100, then their bodies are running off of a uh, less efficient fuel source, and that can manifest as fatigue. So the strategies in which I've um, used to try to mitigate some of these, uh, I'll say another group of patients will be on anyone who's on medications which could cause hypoglycemia. So if they're on a sulfonylurea, if they're on insulin, these types of things, we always titrate those down at the time when we're starting the GLP-1. And these are patients, especially those on insulin, that we keep in very close contact with sometimes weekly phone calls and we're titrating up the GLP-1. Um, in these patients who are on sulfonylureas and insulin, I tend to use a daily GLP-1 before a weekly because the improvement in glucose, while it's wonderful clinically and we get the A1Cs down very quickly, the patient just has such a, a lower glucose uh, level that they're running off of that they can have uh, visual changes, should feel extreme fatigue, mental fogginess. I had a patient who was a law student who was unable to tolerate um, a, a weekly GLP-1 because his glucose just dropped so readily and he just was not able to function. So my experience has been that I prefer in those patients who may be prone to use a, a, a daily GLP-1 and because we can titrate that more uh, not increase the doses as quickly and we can stop it if we need to rather than the weekly. And then if we max out the daily and we want to go to a weekly once the patients have better glucose control because they're becoming more sensitive to their insulin levels, then we can go to a weekly if we still have more work to do in the weight arena or with their glycemic control. Could I follow up? Have you confirmed the low glucose association with the, the fatigue? I have in the patients with diabetes, uh, those yeah. who are uh, on insulin because they have CGMs and you know they're doing their AccuChecks. Um, and I do get some labs on the patients who complain of the fatigue, but it's not at the time when they're having the fatigue. So I don't take give as much credit to that, but definitely the patients with the CGMs and uh, those who are doing AccuChecks, I've been able to confirm that their, their, their glucose has just dropped so efficiently. And we expect this because what do we look out for in patients who are prescribing GLP-1, uh, diabetic retinopathy or macular edema, because we know that the glucose uh, control, glycemic control is so great that it could precipitate um, diabetic retinopathy of those who are at risk. Yeah. yeah, I'm wondering if it's something where, like similar to the relative hypoglycemia that some patients experience um, that, that are diabetics and they kind of adapt to it over time. If they're, you know, they're used to having a blood sugar in the 150s, then we start bringing it down closer to 100s and then their body has just kind of needs time to adapt. I'm wondering if there's potentially a, a, an opportunity for them to kind of press through and, and, and uh, eventually adapt to a lower, I mean, but if the glucose is lower than 60, obviously, you know, you can't really tolerate that level of um, that level, but uh, maybe if it's just 
in the eighties or something, if it is something that they can tolerate and, and uh, adjust to then maybe, because it's just unfortunate when you have such effective medications, but it's pretty much just becomes not an option because of this one side effect. Right. And sometimes I do try to lower the GLP-1 if we're closer to goal to see if they can just maybe maintain weight and, and, and deal with um, a slightly lower energy level. And um, But also the effect of diet, and that is important. We have to make sure those patients don't then eat sugar to offset that fatigue because that gets them back to where they felt better. And then you're working with, I'm decreasing your appetite and you're eating sugar, and then it becomes counterproductive. So um, the, the diet management during that time is really essential. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. There's another question from Emily, and it is, what, at what point, if at all, do you consider combining weight management medications? For example, I've seen a handful of patients in follow-up who were started on a GLP-1 and fentramine by prior providers. Can you offer any guidance for which meds may be synergistic when used together? Um, Yes, yeah, so I look at the goals, um, not as the number on the scale, but really the patient's health, um, their labs, and really their happiness with their weight appearance, things like that. So if a patient is, say, for example, on a GLP-1 and doing well, and we're even meeting weight goal, I had this a few times this week, we met weight goal, their BMI, um, you know, is, you know, we could try to start titrating them off, but I might look at their liver and say, you still have some fatty tissue in your liver. Let's keep going with our weight loss effects. And you have maxed out what you can do with my medication. That would be a time I would consider another medication. So if we're not meeting either the weight goal, the health goals, or we expect something to occur, such as the patient is going to have a, a foot surgery and they're going to be immobilized for four weeks, then we would need to add, uh, add uh, something for synergistic effect. And your example of GLP-1 plus fentramine, I do use that combination commonly because the idea is that the patients uh, lost weight. We've utilized the GLP-1 receptors and we're still getting effect with that. And I like your question because it's not that we stop that and lose all of our GLP-1 benefit, but that we use another pathway. Let's use the norepinephrine receptors to activate more appetite suppression so the patient can continue to eat less, continue to have the energy to do more activity uh, as we're working toward the goals. So the final question is, any guidance on which may be used synergistically together? I really think of it as when the patient reaches a plateau, start all over. And go through all the history labs and everything again and say, what would be the best medication for this patient if I saw them de novo from here? And then you would add that one on keeping in mind safety, efficacy, and of course, cost and accessibility. Um, we're right at seven, Beverly. Yeah, Holly, I was going to, sorry, step in. I don't want to cut no you problem. off. And, um, but I do want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Lofton and Dr. Coley. Um, I apologize to the other participants if we did not get a chance to address your question. Dr. Coley did give us the website www.tristateobesitysociety.org uh, and you are always free to message us or contact us through that website as well if you have further questions about what we do, about obesity medicine, how to get more involved, et cetera. All right, this lecture will be available as a recording for you to view later on, on the website as well. So it's very nice to see everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Coley and Dr. Lofton for your time. Thank you. Good Thank night. you so much. Thanks.